I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer at Gold Derby, joined today by Kate Siegel, who stars as Aaron Green on Netflix's seven-part miniseries, Midnight Mass. So, Kate, I know the show entered production as early as July, August of last year. What was it like um, navigating material that reflects on life, death, purpose, grief, you name it, in the earlier stages of the pandemic at a time when many were ruminating about the very, these very same things? It almost felt um, preordained. It felt a little bit destined in that sense. There was such a, everybody was feeling these big questions start to bubble up in their hearts and in their psyche. And it felt like our little merry band of actors were handed these big concepts while we were experiencing them. And it's not often that your real life matches up so completely with your art, but when it does, there's a certain amount of magic that you feel in the air. It has almost that electricity and you feel the pressure that you normally feel at work, but you also feel the added pressure of a moment that you are expressing something that the world is thinking. And for me in those moments, you know, as an artist, my instinct is to dive in and kind of grind down, but the correct thing to do is kind of lean back and let it flow through you. And so it became almost a meditative exercise in truth, in just accepting the impossible circumstances we were in, on the set, in the world, and as Aaron Green, and filtering them through my own human experience. Yeah, absolutely. And you were on set with a lot of people uh, with whom you'd already worked uh, or been on a set with uh, in the past, Samantha Sloyan and uh, Annabeth Gish and Henry Thomas, and of course, Mike Flanagan and uh, many more. How did this pre-existing camaraderie foster and inform your creative experience working on this show? One of the benefits of working with people that you've um, worked with before is there is a shorthand in the communication, which became very important during this time because correctly, we were all kind of isolated from everybody else. We were isolated from each other on set. And so whereas in before times, as an actor, I could go talk to my director between takes, or I could sit and watch playback with um, the DP and we could talk about what was happening. Now actors were completely pushed aside because we are the red zone. We're in the most dangerous situation because we're unmasked. And so I needed to learn to communicate with Mike, mostly through eye contact. And then there were moments with Zach Guilford where we hadn't seen anybody's faces for weeks. And then in our first day of shooting, the only face I had seen outside of my family was Zach's. And I had to, again, it was about filtering it through this just, this kind of joyous feeling I would, it just seeing a human that I hadn't spent all, you know, all quarantine with, that that became part of Aaron's truth, that his beautiful face was there for me again. Yeah, and like in every Mike Flanagan series, the characters in Midnight Mass are loaded with backstory and layer upon layer upon layer. There's a lot that we learn about Erin's past uh, between the abuse her mother inflicted upon her, the fact that she ran away from Crockett Island at the age of 16, the reason she came back uh, after she found out she was pregnant and much more. But what is some of the backstory uh, that isn't spelled out, that uh, isn't revealed to us viewers that you built and consciously infused into your performance? Well, I think I knew in her heart that Erin always thought of herself as a runner. She didn't escape and run away from home at 16 thinking she was brave. She ran away thinking she was a coward. And then she talks to Riley about how she didn't, she didn't stay in upstate New York. She went south. She joined up with the rock band. She kind of traveled the country. But I pictured Erin as somebody who, when times got tough, when things got overwhelming, she ran. She would cut ties and she would run away. And this was a deep source of shame for Erin. And it came to a head in her marriage where she became pregnant and her husband was abusive like her mother. And again, she ran when things got overwhelming and unbearable and she ran back home and she had sort of made a full circle, right? And this all became very important. This idea of Aaron as someone who was a runner, Aaron who was um, an abandoner, Aaron who thought of herself as a coward in that moment in the rowboat where Riley says, I want you to run. And I needed in that moment, because it is sort of the plie before the leap of this big screaming breakdown, 
this Aaron needs to make that decision that this time, this one time, she's not going to run. And she knows, she assumes that's going to be ending in her death. And she makes that choice. Our reluctant hero, I wanted her to have a whole lifetime of making what she believed to be a cowardly choice. So in this moment, she could become a hero. That's incredibly fascinating. And how did you decide when and to what extent to pepper in some of these uh, layers in the earlier episodes? And which ones to reserve for some of the bigger, more revelatory uh, moments in the second half of the season? I think Erin is her most vulnerable self when she is taking care of somebody else, when she is expressing care towards Riley or care towards the children, or she really is somebody who has a deep maternal instinct. And that's part of who she is in this story. And so as she would be uh, expressing these acts of care, that's where I would start to pepper in more of her truth. So more with Riley than anybody else. And then when she goes to the sheriff to talk about Riley, she's taking care. And so she's more vulnerable with him. But on the opposite, when she's with Bev, she's protecting. She's completely shut down. She is a persona, not a person. And the balance of those two for me was always in where is Aaron's love in this scene? Is it going outward or is she trying to put it inward? And uh, you, you sort of already alluded to it, but uh, we should mention that Erin is a school teacher on the island. Yeah. What role does teaching play in her life? And what do you think she brings to the classroom that others perhaps don't or wouldn't bring? What's funny about the Erin we meet in Midnight Mass is that it is completely different than the Erin the island knew. There is a deleted scene where Erin is in the confessional with Father Paul. And she's talking about how when she was on this island growing up before she left, she was this Jezebel and everyone looked at her as a slut or a lot of slut shaming, even though she was probably a virgin when she left. But Erin had this rejection of everything her mother was. But I think the possibility of becoming a mother allowed Erin's life to be full of forgiveness for her own mother. And as she came back to the island and having run away again and, you know, probably in a lot of shame and a lot of, you know, beating herself up, going back to the school, which probably was the only job available to her at the time. And so, you know, Erin's self-esteem is very low when we meet her. It is about at zero. And she's thinking that she's given up everything she thought she was. She's given up all of her hopes and dreams to protect her unborn child. Mm -hmm. And I think that feeling creates a sense of self-esteem in Erin. And she's like, oh, when I protect children, I start to feel valuable. I start to feel like I am um, a member of society. I start to feel like I have worth. And so I, I would believe that Erin's classroom is full of listening. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of listening to her students that Bev does not. Bev is very much play by the rules, teach for the test, learn the facts. And Erin asks a lot of questions and listens to her students. There's a lot of creative <laughs> writing. <laughs> yeah, and I think you really see, especially in those earlier episodes, is that she really does, uh, she really listens and she's very observant. And um, in that regard, what I'm also interested in is how being a victim of abuse uh, really not only informs the way Erin uh, navigates her own life and processes trauma, but also in the way in which she perceives and forges relationships uh, with other people. We'll get into one specific relationship in just a second, uh, but could you just uh, expand on that a bit first? Well, those of us who have experienced trauma, which I believe is everybody, everybody yeah. is processing the trauma to a certain degree. What it does more than anything else is it keeps you from connecting. It really holds you back because it has taught you false truths about yourself. It has, um, made it harder to get out of your own way. And I believe the Aaron we meet when Midnight Mass starts is she's had that realization that because of what she wants for her child, she wants to create a life that has connection. She wants to be the mother her own mother wasn't. She has, Aaron has a natural optimism where she believes that she can change things and work things out for the better. But Erin's trauma keeps her, when Erin's in a place of trauma, coming from a place of trauma, you'll notice in the show, she gets very still. Mm -hmm. For example, um, there's a stretch of time after the rowboat 
and before immediately up to when they're handing out the cups of poison where Aaron is very still because she is in a very traumatic triggered place. And it's not until people are in danger, people she loves, the children she teaches, Sarah Gunning, Mildred Gunning are in danger that Aaron kind of wakes up and then she starts to move again. But you can see when Aaron's coming from a place of trauma in those moments of stillness that I peppered in throughout the performance. There's a lot of it in the first walk and talk with Riley. Yeah. When yeah. we get to the house and he starts saying that he doesn't know what he's doing and he doesn't know who he is and he doesn't even know why he's alive. And Aaron just freezes because that level of intimacy for her always came with abuse. Her mother, her husband, people who were intimate with her hurt her. And so his vulnerability freezes her up the first time it happens. And, and that, that's a perfect segue into Aaron's relationship uh, with Riley, her childhood sweetheart, um, which I think from the moment uh, they first see each other again, boasts a degree of uh, honesty and genuine compassion for one another, um, of which many relationships are bereft in real life, I would say. Talk me through how it was fleshing out this character constellation and creating this profound intimacy between these two characters with Zach Gilford, uh, who plays Riley. Zach and I, um, we met for the first time at the chemistry read. I uh, had already been cast as Aaron and he was reading, um, a couple actors came in to read for Riley. And there was something about Zach that, and it's a very specific chemistry, right? It's not supposed to be this like fiery white hot they're deeply in love and they've always meant to be together. These are two people who in their innocence were in love and life has really kicked both of them squarely in the stomach. And they're meeting each other again as sort of scarred warriors of life. And so what it is, is these new people have to start to fall in love with each other, but you need to see the comfort of someone who knew you before the world hurt you. And there was something, and this is just the magic of casting. This is the magic of Annie McCarthy and Mike Flanagan. There was something about Zach and me where we just kind of identified with each other. We felt very safe together early on. And then because again, this sort of preordained feeling of the timing of the show, the pandemic ne necessitated that Zach and I were alone in a room together for a lot of time. <laughs> where nobody else was and we were shooting a lot of very intimate stuff right away and we didn't have anybody else to talk to and so we developed a trust very early on and then from there I found it was almost harder to pull away from Zach oh. and I thought that was very interesting because Erin is so removed from people she does not interact and you can see she has three thoughts before she says a line because she's trying to game out what's happening um with Zach, I found it hard to do that. And I think that's exactly where Aaron is too. It was hard for her to hold him at a distance. And that struggle is where their love grew in that struggle. Interesting. And that of course takes us to the two-hander in episode four. You've talked at a great length about uh, this particular monologue, but uh, what I'm interested in is how you prepared for it to ensure that you were still very much in the moment while you were shooting it and what was important to you to communicate subtextually. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this kind of touches on the actor process, which I believe happens in two ways. One of which is the intellectualization of it. And the other is honestly, you have to let your talent free in the moment. So I can talk you through some of it and then know that the rest of it is kind of it's like ice and water. I create the ice and then the, on the day I have to pour the water and we'll see what the, what the drink tastes like. So what I, the first thing I do is I memorize it heavily, completely and word perfect down to the punctuation. And I always do that by walking. If it's a nice time of year, I'll walk outside. If not, I'll go to a gym and a treadmill and I will, because your body, um, there's something about the way your brain activates when you're moving. And if I don't have a rhythm in my body, I'll start to create a rhythm in the speech. And that's sort of what makes it feel false. So I let the rhythm of my heartbeat remind me where I am, or if I am lucky enough to have a beautiful day, I'll be memorizing and, and looking at the sunlight through the leaves. And that image will always be seared into my brain on a particular line. And so I will be able to kind of see the images, which when you get to the performing is what it's about, right? So I know the 
the dialogue inside and out. I could start on any word. I could go forwards, backwards, left and right. That's just the legwork of it. That's the daily practice. And then on the day, I try to remember that for Aaron, it's not a monologue that for Erin, it could stop at the end of every sentence, except there's more she has to say. And there's like, no, but there's one more thing. And do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, but if you understand that, then this reminds me of that. And so it is truly about talking to the person that I'm talking to and listening after every one of my lines to see how their nonverbal response informs the next line. And then I pour the water and then you don't know. And then you trust that, that you're better than your best idea. That's an incredibly fascinating process. And then mm -hmm. you sort of have the opposite of a scene where there's a lot of dialogue uh, at the end of episode five, um, yeah. which is as beautiful as it is devastating. How does this sink, uh, second consecutive tragic loss at the end of episode five alter the course of Aaron's emotional journey? So this is, um, we touched on this a bit earlier when I yeah. talk about Erin as a runner, right? Erin as a quitter, Erin as an abandoner, as she would call herself, she has low self-esteem. And then, so there are these watershed moments in our life where your life is different from one second to the next. Like between, you know, for me, when my dad died, there was a Kate before that moment and there was a Kate after that moment. And there are positive moments like that. When my children are born, there is a Kate before that moment and a Kate after that moment. Erin's had a handful of those. And for her, the amount of time, and <laughs> I cannot overstate how long it takes the adult healthy male body to burn to ash. I mean, she was in that boat for a long time watching that happen. And it's, it's beautifully metaphorical. It's a phoenix, right? She rises from the ashes. She has changed. What was cowardly in her is burned away. It is a moment of choice. So the monologues in episode four are a moment of nakedness. It's when Aaron is slowly taking off every piece of clothing. That's the image I was, I was going with, that she was choosing to be completely naked. And then you take that completely naked person and you burn everything down. And then what rises out is the Aaron who comes back to the island in that rowboat. Wow. Um, and let me tell you, that was certainly a, a devastating scene. And it features one of the most haunting, heart-wrenching on-screen screams of the entire year. And um, But equally devastating is Aaron's final scene um, in which she almost gently slashes the wings of the angel slash creature, whatever we want to call it, um, as she right. dies. What does this scene uh, and the do-over of her idea of death from episode four that in part plays over this scene say about the development that Erin has undergone and the destination she ultimately arrives at? Right. So continuing our build, we have at the beginning of the series, Erin, the runner, Erin, the covered up, Aaron, the still, Aaron, the, the disengaged. And then we got her naked, right? And so we stripped her way over the first four episodes, she's naked. Then at the end of episode five, she's burned it all down. And she has finally made, you're right, in that right at the beginning of six, Aaron has finally made the choice to be an active participant in her own life. She's not gonna run. She knows how it's going to, and she knows she's gonna give her life for these people because she believes Riley. She chooses to trust in something she doesn't have facts about. She only has his story. She hasn't seen any proof. Erin is an agent of faith. She's new to the church. She has faith in Riley's story. She has faith in this new part of her. And she comes back to the island. She experiences all of these impossible things she literally shoots, shoots her abuser in the chest. Like she gets that kind of moment of iconic healing that all of us dream of, where the person who has been torturing you, you get to shoot them. And she gets to save people. And then, I mean, it's, it's, it's so beautifully constructed by Mike Flanagan that then she gets attacked, right? So then this, this large male creature attacks her and, you know, to use a, 
a common phrase like triggers this response in her, this fight or flight response. And Erin, like the best of us, like I would hope I would in that moment, she chooses acceptance. She chooses to, to integrate it into herself as opposed to fight and die, you know, right? So the, the warrior myth is you die fighting and like, ah, Erin <laughs> is a different kind of feminine energy. Erin dies receiving. Erin dies accepting. Erin dies um, returning. And so it's, it's really that whole arc of, of abuse that towards at the very end of it, she took these abusive moments when her mom made her clip the wings of the dove, when this, when her, I assume when her husband attacked her and abused her, those two things were happening to her again. And because of the strength of surviving her trauma, she's able to save the day. And what really st uh, stuck with me from that final monologue and that in your final scene, uh, and I'm quoting here is when um, she reads, I remember I am energy, not memory, not self. I, for some reason, I just think that really sums up her journey and uh, okay. is such a perfect way to cap it off, isn't it? Um, and on a final note, uh, to come full circle a bit, when you sit with this type of material for as long as you did, I have mm -hmm. to imagine that it really seeps into you and really uh, affects you. Yeah. Is there anything that you personally learned from the experience of being in this world and sli of slipping into Aaron's shoes? Oh my gosh. Um, I, I love Aaron so much. She taught me so much about the power of femininity and the power of acceptance and, and the power of allowing you know, sort yeah. of exactly what, what you were just saying, mm -hmm. this sense that there is no me, there never was. It's just, and I, the image that I hold on to is a drop of water returning to the ocean of which it was always a part. Mm -hmm. And that kind of knowing that we are all basically one thing, this kind of metaphysical feeling that people can kind of scoff at, but in, in your quiet moments, it makes sense that we're all just kind of connected. And this idea that we're different things and some of us are men and some of us are women and some of us are black and some of us are white, that's not real. There, that doesn't exist. In the same way we all agreed on Sunday that when it was 3 a.m., it then just became 2 a.m. again. We just all agreed. Yeah, yeah. It's all a construct. And obviously you can't live your life like that at the grocery store or else you're like, you're like I am the blueberries. Like you can't always. But to me, the day-to-day -day existence of that is kindness, is understanding that because there is no difference materially between my atoms and your atoms, it's easier to be kind than it is to be violent. Yeah, and I think that is uh, such a perfect uh, note to end on. To our viewers, make sure to check out Midnight Mass on Netflix if you haven't already. Kate, thank you so much for joining <laughs> me today. You went so deep. <laughs> 